Feel free to turn your seat so you can most easily see the visitor screen during the power of our tonight's presentation. Thank you and enjoy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Paul Blair. I'm the president and CEO of Young Arts, and I want to welcome you to our friends. salon that we had with Wynton Marsalis the week before. And then in March, we've got a performance art piece uh, created by Billy Skagars Redford and her husband, Robert Redford, is going to be making a special appearance. So I urge you to keep looking at our website and in the newspaper. If you've noticed in today's newspaper, we are front page, top of the fold. So I'm really excited that we're actually starting to get a lot of coverage for the activities that we're doing here. So today, you know, this is the launch of our new design arts program. And can you think of a better panel to have than Paola Antonelli, and then later on joined by Frank Gehry and our uh, Arison awardee last night, Zaha Hadid. So we're so grateful for you all to be here and to tell you a little bit more about it. I want to introduce my good friend, Tony Jones, who is the president emeritus of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and one of the great architects of this new design arts program. So, Tony Jones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And as Paul has said, uh, this is really a tipping point moment in the future of young arts. And so it's a real celebration for us this morning because of the exciting program that we have. For over 30 years, Young Arts has been presenting an opportunity for brilliantly talented young men and women in high schools in America to come here to Miami for an intensive masterclass week. And the disciplines you know are music and theater, jazz, spoken words, cinematic arts, photography, visual arts, etc. But last year we discussed introducing what I think might be seen as the missing part, architecture and design in the design arts. And we thought many people, many young men and women spread across the entire United States are thinking of themselves as becoming architects, designers, product designers, ceramic designers, industrial designers, jewelry designers, fashion designers, many aspects of design. So we thought about what would a, an intensive one-week charrette, and I think you all know the meaning of that word, it's a high-pressure cooker week, people being together working on a program, what would that look like if we introduced that to young arts? And to direct that program, we invited two master teachers to create the format of that week and to actually teach the program. So from Florida International University, FIU, here in Miami, Adam Driesen, the Senior Associate Dean of Architecture. And from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Professor of Design, Helen Maria Nugent. But she's not from, she's not actually from Chicago. She's from Glasgow, Scotland, so she talks like me, like this, right? And you'll hear that in a minute, right, when she comes up here. <laughs> we advertised on the website. We told everybody design arts is now going to become part of young arts. And we got 400 applications from across the country. We got applications from California, from New Mexico, from everywhere in between. And no surprise to you, of course, from Dash, 
here in Miami. And of those 400, 12 were selected to become the design pioneers, and they're here today. Ladies and gentlemen, design pioneers, rise and be recognized. And as we thought what opportunity we'd be able to give to these students, we thought one thing would be wonderful is what if they were given a world view of what design is doing? Where has design been? Where's design's future? What is the meaning of this elastic word design? And we thought, well, really, there's only one person in the world who has that encyclopedic, that global, comprehensive, holistic view of design. And so we thought, gosh, I wonder if we could invite Paula Antonelli to join us. Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He's created some of the most exciting and wonderful exhibitions about the meaning of design, where design is and where it's going. Paula very generously agreed to come, and not only to speak individually in a group with the students, but also to do this presentation publicly. And so Young Arts, working with the AIAGA chapter, here in Miami and the AIA chapter in Miami present as a gift to the professions in Miami, to the architecture profession, to the design profession, and to the students of those disciplines, present as a gift to you this morning a presentation by Paula Antonelli. But grace upon grace, as we thought about the presentation, we extended an invitation to two giants of thinking and of practice, people who have changed the entire world of architecture, the way we think about architecture, the way we look at architecture, the way we perceive the futures of architecture, and what an extraordinary thing it was that they agreed to join us today, Zaha Hadid and Frank Gehry. So. So our format this morning is simple. Paul Antonelli will make a presentation which you'll be able to see on the screens surrounding us this morning. And after that, Adam Dreesen and Helen Maria Nugent with Zaha Hadid and Frank Gehry will come to the stage and there will be an informal discussion, following which, if time allows, we're going to allow you to ask questions from the floor, which I'm sure you want to do. So rather than listening to me, why don't we really think about the elastic edges of design and what design futures are, ladies and gentlemen, Paula Antonelli. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to get acquainted with this amazing foundation and with the students. Of course, my heroes are right here in this corner. We've already spoken about them. So glad to see you here, even though you've been dancing until four in the morning. That's really touching and moving, and I appreciate it. But I would also like to congratulate the other students, the students in the performing arts from last night. They were fantastic. Is anybody here? Uh -huh. and I would hope not. And also the students in the visual arts, I got to see the exhibition two nights ago and I was so stunned by your prowess. And, you know, there are some images and some uh, examples of your work that will stay with me forever. Now, the presentation, the presentation about the future of design. As we mentioned, the, um, the screens are a little bit to the side, so I'm going to direct, you know, I'm going to pretend I'm a flight attendant, you know, so the exits are on the side. I would like our great IV, AV people to just make, it, make me dark. I disappear. It's all about the screens, please. Can we lower the lights here? I think that the best introduction to today's conversation and to the fact that uh, I will be talking with Zaha and with Frank, who really know about the future of design, is to show what design is that it was not in the past. You know, we're used to thinking of design as a pretty kind of classic um, set of objects. Like, for instance, oops, it's not working anymore, I don't think. 
even though it was working before, great, thank you. So when you think of design, you usually think of uh, some of the traditional platforms of the Museum of Modern Art. You can see a little more, I don't know if you can all see it, but you know, classical chairs and furniture, you know, Mondrian, Rietveld, you know, the connection with the arts. But in truth, even at the Museum of Modern Art, often design has changed, and it has become something like this. Design is branching in so many different directions these days that have to do, of course, still with making, of course still with furniture, of course still with artifacts, but also that have to do with the future of mankind. Uh, designers are concerned about human beings, designers of all kinds, from architects to information designers, communication designers, furnitures. Um, they are concerned with uh, the destinies of mankind in some cases, that they are just concerned with making products that sell. But they keep this kind of humanity at the center of their focus. So in some cases, what they do is to think about the future. What you see here is an installation in the Museum of Modern Art of the work of Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby are some, some of the most important exponents of uh, uh, critical design. And what you see here is their work called Foragers. They think of a future where there will be a shortage of food, and therefore, as human beings, we might have to go back to eating things that we have not eaten for centuries and millennia. For instance, roots, algae, and leaves out of trees. But since we've become such sissies and we're not really able to do that anymore, we have to build outsourced gastrointestinal systems that will allow us to do so. So these beautiful contrasts that you see here are, uh, you see them now um, worn by, that's how they treat high school students in France. These are high school students in the French countryside modeling the gastrointestinal systems and pretending they're eating algae and roots. But what I'm trying to say is that design sometimes has this speculative look and perspective towards the future. And some designers today don't anymore build functional objects, but they try to think of the possible consequences of our choices of today in the future. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So even though we're still dealing with furniture, and you see here some of the recent acquisitions at MoMA from um, a Hoffman stool to a Tokujin Yoshioka chair, we also have acquisitions that look like this. This is the work of Ralph Borland. Ralph Borland is a South African designer and artist, and this is something called Suited for Subversion. It's a padded suit that you can wear when you are going into protests, when you are publicly protesting. So it's going to protect you from the batons of the police. You know, it's really quite nice. Um, also, it has a little camera on top of your head that allows you to film the action, just in case. But the most beautiful feature is a loudspeaker on the heart that amplifies your heartbeat. So it's like, you know, the flower to the cannon, you know, remember, I'm a human being. And also, if you think of hundreds of people wearing the suit and moving together, it's this terrifying collective heartbeat that is going to be a thunder of humanity against the meanness of the police. I mean, it's a little ideological, but still, you see what I'm talking about. It's a very different form of design, as is a different form of design, the at sign. The at sign is an acquisition that we did at MoMA two years ago that in a way exemplifies everything that we want from design today. It was created in the Middle Ages. You know, the, uh, the, the handwriting monks used it as a way to abbreviate the Latin preposition ad, which was in relationship with and uh, uh, in the direction of. And this little sign remained throughout the centuries, used by merchants and by accountants to talk about at the rate of. So it was in the first typewriters in the US in the 19th century, it stayed on, it was always on any keyboard. So in 1971, when electronic engineer Ray Tomlinson was part of the consortium that was building the internet for DARPA, for the Association for the Special um, uh, Experimental Agency of the Government of the United States, he was in charge of email. And he had always this, the name of the person, the name of the machine, and this long string of code. He looked at the keyboard, saw this weird, beautiful sign, researched it, discovered that it meant exactly what, it need, what he needed in connection with, and adopted it. So centuries later, the same sign is used in the same way. 
So there's a transition from the past to the present and to the future, and without even any need to redo keyboards. No, no, it, there's even more. It's in the public domain. So this acquisition is one of the first acquisition of something that is in the public domain. It belongs to MoMA, it belongs to everybody, and it's a way of thinking of sustainability, open source, crowdsourcing. It really symbolizes so much more than it is. This is the kind of acquisitions that we want to present to the world these days. I'm gonna move beyond this slide because you won't be able to read it, but design has moved from being form follows function to uh, responding to functions that do not exist yet, that have nothing to do with simply sitting and walking, that have to do with the destinies of the human race in the future. And of course, we're still thinking of nature, we're still thinking as we did throughout the centuries that nature does it best and that we need to learn from it. But instead of just mimicking nature, you know, biomimicry is a relatively um, young discipline but it arcs back to centuries, instead of just mimicking nature, we try to go beyond it and actually design with nature. Yesterday when I was having the master class with the students, it was quite fantastic and they were asking me about the relationship between design and science, which has become so vibrant in the past few decades and especially in the past few years. And I was telling them about the work, you know, Tony Jones, who spoke to us before, be besides being president emeritus of the Art Institute in Chicago, also used to be the rector of the Royal College of Art in London, where so much experimentation is going on when it comes to the relationship between design and science. Scientists and designers have found great ways to communicate. Of of course, designers love to work directly with scientists because they have all these new revolutions at their disposal. And scientists love to work with designers because when they work with designers, they are free. They have poetic license. They have design license. They're free from the strictures of peer review that are usually uh, sub the subject of so many scientific experiments. And the most important thing is that by making this relationship between, between designers and scientists directly Direct, we come to understand something that is very important about design in the future. Innovation and revolutions would never become reality without designers. You know, architects and designers are the ones that take microwaves, the lines of code of the internet, and all other technological revolutions and make them into life so that we all can use them. And that's why nano design is becoming so prevalent uh, along with tissue design. So many designers these days are working on biological tissues, especially with synthetic biologists. It's a new branch of biology that is almost like creating new entities and new beings with bricks of DNA. So you see here a few examples of work that actually was exhibited at MoMA that went into the collection. Um, the ring on the bottom of the slide, it's actually, that was done at the RCA, and it's a wedding ring that is made by harvesting the bone cells of your loved one. So you take a little pinch from a bone in the shoulder and you make an, a wedding ring out of it. Uh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and also so uh, on the top left, you see um, another exercise that was about the meat of the future. You know that we have already been able to do the first patties, beef patties in vitro, and of course that raises all sorts of ethical and behavioral questions. Are you vegetarian morally or are you vegetarian because of your taste choices? But no matter what, if you can develop meat in vitro, what should a steak of the future look like? And this designer went around the British countryside until he found the most beautiful cow that he had ever seen, stuck the cow into an MRI machine, found the best MRI of the, uh, of the innards of the cow, and modeled this ideal steak on the ideal innard of the ideal cow for us to uh, eat in the future. So you see, it's, uh, it's work that is borderline art, and in sometimes instead it's full-fledged engineering. This is DARPA, once again, the uh, experimental agency of the government of the United States uh, that's experimenting with new infantry uh, tools. And in this case, you see this ox. It's a robot that really looks like an ox. So back in, like in centuries ago, these kind of like uh, heavy duty animals become the model for robots. So this is our relationship with nature right now, much more complicated and not only about imitation. Sometimes it's about going way beyond. This is the beautiful work of a British 
designer that works with amputees and that makes for them the most gorgeous artificial limbs that are true works of art that go well beyond the functional presence, but and instead really try to give an expression and to make the best out of what is considered normally a handicap and instead we start to begin to think of as an augmentation. And to top it all, there's new technologies that are helping um, us progress and in some times are also helping us think. I'm sure you're all familiar with rapid manufacturing. Rapid manufacturing has existed for decades, but recently it has found a re new resurgence and a new birth thanks to the maker's culture, thanks to small 3D printing machines, and thanks to a whole uh, really like, like resurgence of small labs in cities throughout the United States and throughout the world. But of course, while we're all excited about rapid manufacturing, there are some designers that talk about slow manufacturing. So you see there examples of rapid, and then at the bottom, a beautiful vase that is made by building a scaffolding for 45,000 bees to build a vase in a week. So from rapid to slow manufacturing and from trying to use the techniques at our, at our disposal to actually refusing them or thinking about them critically. And that's what's amazing about design today the critical attitude towards reality and not taking at face value anymore the technologies that are available, but thinking instead of coupling them with the old technologies. You see in this slide at the top right, a table that is made using at the same time CNC milling, so cutting all the profiles from wood and then putting them together by hand. So much of this design is experimental and we'll never find a huge market, or at least it will have a very reduced market. But some of it instead is very mindful of the reality of what people can afford and how people can use objects. This is uh, Dirk van der Kooy, he's a designer from the Netherlands, who took over some discarded robots from car manufacturers and retrained them to make objects out of slurry, a slurry of plastic from recycled refrigerator. He builds beautiful chairs that retain for about 400 euros that are painted, that have the irregularity and the uniqueness of uh, on-time manufacturing, but at, at the same time also have this idea of serial production. So you see the work is amazing. And one thing that is incredibly interesting about design in the future there's, is that so much can be done almost in-house. You know, it used to be once upon a time as a designer, if you wanted to build a plastic chair, you needed to find somebody, a manufacturer that was willing to invest $50,000 at least in a mold for your plastic chair. Today, resins and other materials and technology available enable you to do things almost at home or in your office, which makes for a much more entrepreneurial spirit coming to fruition. Again, the, our relationship with nature. This is a beautiful work by Neri Oxman it's, uh, and her group at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, talk about 3D printing. In this case, the 3D printers are small silkworms, 60,000 of them. By studying the behavior of silkworms really in space, seeing how they behaved with the different conditions of height and uh, light and temperature, she and her students were able to train the silkworms or to force the silkworms. Actually, they were not forced. They had a better life than many uh, industrial silkworms in that they were allowed to die by themselves instead of being boiled as usually happens, but they built this wonderful pavilion. And so here you see that the balance, the center of gravity moves away from 3D printing by human beings and it's instead about harnessing nature to do what it does best and to help us build in the most sensible, organic and sustainable way. And talking about the future of 3D printing, you know, we're used to thinking of 3D printing using resins and lasers and and uh, synthering and machinery. And in this case, instead, Markus Kaiser, a German student working in the Netherlands, decided to use the sun and sand from the desert to do to 3D print these beautiful vessels. You know, and uh, the methodology is very simple. Fresnel lens, what we've been doing, well, not all of us, but you know, I haven't done it, but you know, burning insects with a lens or burning uh, leaves with a lens with the sun. Um, it uses the same and it harnesses the fact 
sa that sand is made of silica and therefore can become glass if raised at the right temperature. So the beauty of thinking of a new technology but using old materials and hand-powered hand tools or solar-powered tools has also a very poetic and strong uh, suggestion to what we could do in the future. We've been also uh, collecting a lot of visualization design. Visualization design is absolutely important today because of the amount of data that is available to us. We keep on talking about and hearing about big data. It's become a cliche, but the truth is that big data will never be useful unless the data is analyzed and presented to the public and to the people that need it in a thoughtful way. And in this case, you're looking at visualizations that are very popular for a wide audience and that are also quite beautiful because synthetic uh, is in, synthesis is important, but also aesthetic intention is important for a museum of art. In particular, well, besides a machine that shows how computers play chess with itself, you can also see a map of all the winds in the United States. If you want to look at it online, it's called Wind Map, and it's a beautifully poetic and immediately understandable way to render the situation of the winds in the United States at any time. It looks like a wheat field that is swiped by the winds themselves. Visualization design requires not only great skills as designers and also great capacity of synthesis, but also a spatial attitude and a spatial um, savviness that is typical of architects. And that's why so many different fields of design that used to have all this appellation, fashion, in information, furniture, architecture was by itself, today are working together. And that's what we see happening, and we'll talk about it. I hope in the panel, a different system for education in design and architecture that I think uh, will bode for an amazing future. Design can also be very political. You see here um, the map of Brooklyn and those red dots that you see are blocks for which the government, either federal or local, spends at least a million dollars a year only to keep some of the inhabitants in prison or in halfway houses. So in a way, it's a measure of the entropy in society that is generated by our kind of twisted um, uh, prison system. And it's really interesting because this is data publicly available, and you can read it in the New York Times. You can find out that in Brooklyn alone, there are at least 350 of these blocks. You can be outraged for 20 minutes. But if you see it red over black, that kind of image remains engraved in your mind, not only in your retina, but in your memory, and will bring you to think of things in a different way. So design can be also propaganda, and it's uh, something to be taken seriously, even though it still is, for the most part, relegated in major publications in the style pages or in the house and home section. Design is very serious business, and it's something that we should all start to learn about differently. Even video games. You know, um, we started acquiring video games at MoMA about a year and a half ago. And it was great to see the reaction that happened in popular culture and in so-called high culture. Because, you know, the funny thing, they're still high and low. I didn't know about it. Um, we started collecting video games as great examples of interaction design. Interaction design is the form of design that deals with our behavior with machines and with screens. And interaction designers have, are able to control us somehow. They design our behavior. That's what's so amazing and so important about interaction design. Interaction design is the screen of your phone. It's the ATM machine that you curse because it doesn't give you the balance that, at the time that you need it or is always broken. It's everything. It's the new space in which we live in all the time. And in a way, video games are some of the purest examples of interaction design because the function is almost removed, even though there are some serious video games that the UN and UNESCO are putting together and the World Health Organization. Most video games are leisure. And we started collecting them uh, and... Uh, to much to the dismay of very few art critics that thundered against the fact that, oh, you cannot put Pac-Man next to Matisse and Picasso. Now, of course, at the time of Matisse and Picasso, they were considered Pac-Man, but, you know, 
you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, I just think it's very important for us at MoMA uh, to communicate to our wide audience that there are new forms of design that they should be aware of because we are an educational institution after all. So interaction design definitely and then open source design. I'm trying to give you all of these glimpses of where design is going because they all relate also to what Zaha and Frank are doing. So the conversation is in a way I hope introduced by all this. Open source is the uh, symbol of contemporary generosity, in my opinion. It's also the symbol of so much trouble in many cases, but, uh, but the intentions are always good. And this particular project is what I use always to crystallize and to explain this new attitude, which is about sharing, sharing code, sharing information, sharing the design process in order to count on the scientifically proven uh, better efficiency of a collective mind over an individual one. This project is called um, the iWriter, and it was developed by a few engineers and artists that were centered around the iBeam organization in New York, and it was to help a gra graffiti artist from LA, Tempt One, who is immobilized in a hospital bed because of uh, Lou Gehrig disease, ALS. It was a way to help him tag a building in downtown LA once again from his hospital bed by using a very cheap computer camera, very cheap eyeglasses, and uh, a contraption that enables one to project laser on buildings in town, and code that enabled Tempt One to actually write with his eyeball. The importance of this work is not only in, uh, in the life of Tempt One, but it's in the life of so many people that are immobilized and cannot afford the old systems that would enable them to write with their eyeballs for $15,000. This can all be done for $60, and it's all online, available for everybody to use. It's quite amazing, and it's something that we see more and more these days with the share economy and with crowdsourcing. They are really new expressions of the attempt to create this kind of universal pool of knowledge. At the same time, there's an intimacy to the work of some designers that is quite amazing. Yesterday, I got from the students the question of what about religion? What about our spiritual dimension? There are designers that are actually working on that. There are designers that are creating um, tools for nuns, cloistered nuns in the north of England to communicate with God and to actually have more pertinent prayers for God to answer. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is almost like a ticker tape, but it's very thoughtfully designed because it looks like an altarpiece almost. And these cloistered nuns in the north of England only get newspapers from the Vatican and what do you learn from a newspaper from the Vatican, please? So um, they need to know more, and that ticker tape is connected to the BBC News, and it gives them things that are happening in the world, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and uh, they say, the nuns that are actually using it, that it keeps their prayers pertinent. They use it every day. And on the left-hand side, instead, you see a Muslim prayer mat that is designed by a Turkish designer that has a compass module in it and an electroluminescent sheet underneath. So it lights up when it's in the right direction with Mecca. Now, we all know where Mecca is, but it doesn't matter. It's a symbolic gesture to tame technology and to show the importance of our human ancient rituals. And it also is important for designers sometimes to work on difficult issues um, about mankind. For instance, communication with other human beings. This is one of my favorite objects that I've seen in the past few years. And it's an object that is so controversial that, you know, um, I've, I've had a hard time getting into the MoMA collection, but I hope that I will one day. It's a menstruation machine. It's a contraption that is supposed to be used by men to really experience what it means to have your period. Um, so it looks like a chastity belt, you know, it's like metal, it's quite beautiful. It has electrodes on your lower abdomen, so it gives you cramps, right? Then it has a reservoir in the back. As a guy, you're supposed to draw your blood, put your blood there, and there's a cannula that delivers it in between your legs. So there's the whole, the whole experience of uneasiness. And to me, it's such a moving object because it's an example of the extreme form of communication. I mean, menstruation is one of the latest taboos in almost every religion and in almost every uh, interaction between men and women. It's a tough thing. And to, to see it condensed in such beautiful ways, this is uh, Sputniko. She's a, also an RCA graduate, and she is in the, um, in the US and in Europe a designer. She's now a professor at the Media Lab in Cambridge. And instead, in Japan, 
and she's a pop star. So every time she does something, she does the object, and then she does the, the character that's her in the picture, and then also she does a pop video. And the one for the menstruation machine is hilarious if you want to go online and look for it. It's about this guy over here. He's a guy, but he wants to try and be a woman for a day, and he struts around town with the menstruation machine and a girlfriend of his, and the girlfriend is singing, it hurts, right? And it's going to hurt even more. I mean, it's just, uh, at the same time, hilarious and really deep. And you know, um, even though these forms of communication are extreme and so important, they're also so common to us. This is the work of the students of the Eindhoven Academy of Art and Design, who in 2006 mounted a final and end of the year show in Milan about death. They all worked on death. And one of the most moving, it was beautiful work in this beautiful uh, old building in Milan. And one of the most beautiful pieces or most moving was the work of Tessa van der Koy, uh, who documented her cancer with animation, animated design and didn't make it to the opening of the show. She died before. So reality, design is about reality. When, even when it's speculative, even when it is poetic, it's about reality, as is, for instance, this mind detonator designed by Masood Hassani. Masood Hassani is an Afghani designer. He's 28. He studied also in Eindhoven. And when he had to do his thesis work, he decided to work on his experience growing up in Afghanistan, in, in the north of Afghanistan, in a place that was riddled with minefields, and playing with his brother and his friends by making these really little toys that were power, powered by the wind that sometimes would end up in minefields, and so he couldn't retrieve them. So for his thesis, he designed this dandelion-like structure made with very simple, uh, a very simple core of printed plastic and very simple feet of printed plastic and bamboo sticks that can be rolled onto minefields and explodes when it encounters mine. But it explodes and doesn't lose too many legs. And the legs can be replaced quite easily because bamboo is easy to find and easy to grow all over the world. Of course, it needs a lot of work and it needs a lot of development and he is working with the Dutch army to actually develop it sensibly. But it is a beginning and it's about personal experience and the reality of one of the most difficult situations in the world, which is landmines. That's why we started one of our latest projects at MoMA is about design and violence. It's called designandviolence.moma.org. And it's a project in which we explore objects, we explore the idea of violence today by looking at objects that have an ambiguous relationship with it. For instance, you, s you see here at the bottom right, the so-called green bullets that are currently being developed by the US Army. They're green bullets because they're lead-free, so they won't harm the environment. You'll still be dead, but the environment will be safe, which I think is really beautiful. And to the left of it, you see the famous or infamous 3D printed gun that was so much in the news last year. And I remember, and uh, this goes to our naivete as designers sometimes, we can be very Pollyannish. I remember when I first heard about the 3D printed gun, my jaw dropped and oh, I was so shocked. I mean, I still think I was a little pathetic, but it's the truth. I was shocked by the fact that 3D printing, which I always consider such a benign, of course, it's for designers, technology could be used to such evil goals. Well, that's the truth. Everything we do can have another side, as you well know, and we have to be conscious of that. And I think it's very important that we're conscious also of where design can lead us in the future. It's a, a brand new moment for design. It's full of possibilities the relationship between design and architecture, between design and science, between architecture and science is changing by the moment and designers are, become, are becoming more critical and more assertive human beings. And sometimes in order to get where we need to go, we have to burn a few chairs. This is a beautiful Mendini installation from 1974, the burning chair, the last time that designers were really political and critical and it's back today. So I hope that our future after we burn a few chair will be as bright as our past. Thank you very much.
Switch in the middle. Yeah, we have microphones. So I, I want to start by, um, in a way, welcome my, welcoming my colleagues from the design community. Um, I'm part of that community, and it's an extraordinary privilege uh, to welcome you, both literally and metaphorically, to the Young Arts tent. Um, I think this is a, an exciting endeavor, and uh, we look forward to many more opportunities to discuss um, and, uh, and really embrace design, both uh, locally and globally. Um, so I think what we're going to do is um, just kind of chat and have a discussion. And I think that Paola really um, talked to us um, in an amazing way and talked about the sort of this new frontier of design and what designers do. And this notion that they are somehow embracing um, the speculative and ideological tools of art and combining that with uh, rigorous research um, and the application of knowledge from a range of areas that traditionally are outside of the design disciplines, things like robotics, synthetic biology, medicine, nano design, computing, um, and a range of sort of uh, material and engineering science areas. Um, this is sort of amazing because it talks about both depth and breadth in a way that I think we probably haven't seen in the design disciplines, um, perhaps since, I don't know, the Renaissance. Um, so we wanted to spend some time maybe talking about that notion of design as research and research as design. It's certainly a hot topic in the schools right now, and the Royal College is, of course, I think at the forefront of this. But even here in Miami at FIU, we are reconceptualizing our curricula um, in order to sort of embrace this, this trend. So I think Helen's going to start off with a question that um, I think brings together what you all are doing in practice with what Paula is interested in, in terms of her curatorial uh, area. So yes, wonderful to be on stage with all of you. What a... So I, primarily, I'd love to ask you, Frank and uh, um, Zaha, if it's possible for you to talk about the kind of research that's involved in the work that you do, and specifically, if you could give any examples of how research has allowed you or is allowing you to actually push forward with your practice, to push into new kinds of ways of thinking about buildings or actually any aspect of your practice that you want to talk about. But how do you involve research in your studios? Vey. <laughs> That's a, it's an old English expression, oy vey. Um, well, I'm very um, personally very, um, I work intuitively, so I don't have a clue where I'm going when I start, and I try things, and I'm curious. And that curiosity in my life, separate from doing that stuff, crumpling paper as they think I do, um, separate from that, I'm curious. So I spend time with scientists. I've actually, a couple of years ago, I spent a month or six weeks at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Microbiology and got into their thing. I've, gotten interested in neuroscience. Uh, they're interested in creativity, as you know. And so there's a lot of stuff back and forth. Um, music, literature, I mean, there's intuitive and experiments, and there's pathways. In, in, I've always been curious about materials. Uh, I've always been curious about materials that are throwaway. So, uh, because there's a, when I started in architecture, I thought that um, the cities looked terrible and nobody seemed to complain. And that the, there was a lot of denial in the world about things. And there was somebody 
did something special, they got beat up for doing it. So I was curious about that. So I found a material that was ubiquitous worldwide. Everybody used in mass quantities called chain link fence, but they all hated it. And, and if you went to a rich guy's house who would say, I hate chain link, you would find a tennis court in the middle of his yard. He could see from every room in his house, but because it was a tennis court, it wasn't chain link. So I was interested in materials like that. I got into cardboard and all kinds of crap. So I don't know that I'm, I'm fascinated with, I mean, I, the menstrual machine is, <laughs> pretty exciting, and <laughs> I, I mean it. I think uh, it's amazing. So I think that it, that should cut both ways, that women, we should find gadgets to s explain to women Frank, what, what we go through. Frank? I, I, our, our insatiable appetites. I, I think, Frank, <laughs> if, I, if I could for a minute, I think you're being a little bashful with us, because I'd like you to talk a bit about this other operation that you have called Gary Technologies. Oy vey, another, <laughs> a double oy vey. Um, oh, God. <laughs> I wish I'd never heard of it. <laughs> um, I was, I realized that, um, that if I could, uh, could clarify precisely how things were built, that uh, it take the mystery out of the person built, for the mis person building it, that I could do things that were dif different than what the, the, the construction industry was doing. I also realized there was a lot of waste in the construction industry that, uh, and the waste were related to misunderstanding. So if anybody built anything, you've heard of change orders. Change orders are 15% of the construction industry. Multiply it by the world construction industry. You want to talk about LEEDS certification, get on that one because that's bigger than all of that. Anyway, that was my mindset. That's what I was worried about, that's what I was thinking about. And I met, uh, I got in, I was trying to do some curvy stuff for Vitra the first time, and I couldn't build it. I couldn't, I was using descriptive geometry, which is what I was taught in college, pre-computer, you know, um, and I couldn't translate. So I found Katia, makes airplanes, very complicated, and I started using it, and voila, so we, we did, Bill Bow, no two pieces of steel the same size, uh, with six subcontractors bidding 1% spread, 18% under budget. That's when I realized something, there's something there. And I kept using it, developing it, and uh, it became kind of a separate business thing in the office that I paid no attention to because I wasn't interested in it as a business. I was interested in it as a tool, and I was, uh, I shared it with my friends, uh, a lot of people, I, and, and it's been helpful, and uh, it's gotten a life of its own now, and uh, I want to disappear <laughs> from that, because it's not my major, major thing, although I can see what it's, what it's doing, so. So, um Dame Hadid, I'm sorry, I didn't call you that earlier. Let's call me Zaha <laughs> because I... Tell us about some of the amazing research that goes on in your office. Um, well, I think maybe in terms of... The re well, in the office, um, I think in the early days, uh, we did mostly kind of, I would say, graphic and urban research or um, how you can uh, look at buildings in a different kind of way. Uh, the office now is much bigger, obviously, and um, our interests are also very varied. You know, I, I also, like Frank, teach. I teach in Vienna and, and at Yale, and um, the focus of the studio is always about interpretation of that uh, given task. And um, 
And I think what is uh, interesting and in in how to make possible, my, uh, to be honest, my main focus has always been architecture. I like also working on objects. Uh, I don't know too much about all the uh, current going on in technology, but of course we, we, we benefit from it. And, um, but I think that it was, it was more interesting for me how all these uh, inventions and uh, uh, interpretations impact on the world of architecture and urbanism. Uh, and in a sense for me, how do I make a better uh, space? And, um, and, and uh, so I think there are very, that research in all these different ways, whether 3D modeling or new fabrication new materials, um, it started off, for example, I'll give you an example, when we did um, the, the Wolfsburg um, Museum, uh, we looked at uh, this new form of making concrete so it can make uh, kind of soft, uh, uh, soft spaces. Um, and then more recently in Baku, using also new material to uh, make the ground and the building in a way seamless. And uh, now we are involved with kind of um, 3D modeling to make maybe uh, jewelry or whatever. And I think what, what has been interesting for us to do research on how to achieve a certain kind of obviously interest from a very small object for a very large, uh, you know, spatial, interpretation, whether it's a building or an urban design. And I think it is very exciting how our science and math, and uh, because before there were um, demarcated lines between all the fields. And what is, I think, interesting now that these lines have become not blurred, but they are very seamless. Yeah. And also uh, the technology in building has become also seamless. So you can actually, the information flow between all the participants is seamless, and it makes it much, um, it makes it much more precise and more, uh, uh, more interesting in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think both of your offices are absolutely pushing uh, our world forward. You know, the tools and technologies and the ways you're thinking about public space and human habitation. Is I mean, as also, um, to be honest, it's also very interesting and useful for me to teach, and but Patrick Schumacher is also here who is the one who uh, runs the DRL uh, program in London, one of the directors, is also very interested in all these, uh, in those issues. And he's must be more better versed than I am in all these kind of robotics and, and so on. But I think it is the way where it feeds back into uh, the making of architecture for me is very exciting. Thank you. Um, I want to, Paula, it's okay if I bring you back into our conversation for a moment. Um, you mentioned actually briefly that uh, one of your recent exhibitions, the Design and Violence ex exhibition, and uh, I believe you called it a curatorial experiment in one way or another. It's, uh, I work a lot on the coming together of the digital and physical. That's one of the areas that I'm really interested in. And many people talk about online exhibitions. There's not such a thing yet. Trying to make exhibitions online is a recipe for disaster. Um, we'll get there maybe one day. So I call it a curatorial experiment because there are objects, there are, there's curatorial analysis, there's a checklist, there's a sequence, there's a narrative, but it's not a physical space. So when I'll be able to put the two together, I'll use the word exhibitions, but so far, you know, I've been um, also running this department of research and development for MoMA in the past two and a half, in the past two years, and um, uh, one of the uh, areas that I'm studying is exactly how to do curatorial work online. There are some really big problems. For instance, when people decide to go see a show, they have to get out of bed, take a shower, they have to get dressed, they have to get out, and they have to take the subway, they have to schlep to the museum to use, you know, another very strong New York expression. Once they get there, they have an investment that's already made. They have to pay attention. Online, you hear everybody talking about eliminating friction. I'm sorry, I want to do the opposite. I would like people to actually have to work to get on the website and maybe I can have a real show there. But until we find all these different ways not to mimic physical behaviors, but rather to design new behaviors that elicit responses of uh, similar intensity and depth, we cannot really talk about exhibitions online. So that's a curatorial experiment because it has, it's a prolonging and it's, a, it's a absolutely part of my work, but it's not an exhibition. So as two architects who have um, 
built a pretty substantial reputation for doing extraordinary museums. Um, do you find that discussion sort of interesting? Is it a provocation, th this idea of creating a sort of metaphysical museum? And how might you imagine, as designers, being involved in the construction of that metaphysical museum? By wearing that machine. Yeah. I, I tend to be, I guess because of my age, because of my realities, live in the time I'm in with the opportunities I get. So if I'm asked to do a museum, uh, like Bill Bow, which uh, was pretty exciting. I had a client named Tom Krenz, a super genius, visionary. Zaha has worked with him beyond belief. And he was open and we played. We both understood the art world very well. We were both seriously involved with a big part of our lives in that world. We understood where it was going, where, what was this, that things were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that the artists were becoming more brazen in their willingness to engage with architecture, which is different. I mean, the old plop on the plaza thing was, people were really pissed off about that. Uh, so you had pretty aggressive artists like Richard Serra and C. Armijani and whatever. Uh, and so we understood that. We wanted to make a place for that. But we also had to make a place for artists who are not dead, no longer there, couldn't protect themselves. So we kind of split it up. We made what we called classical galleries for, for, uh, for those guys, for Ad Reinhardt and whatever. And uh, made galleries that were provocative, that had some kind of provocation, which is, God bless her, what my friend over here does in, great, in a great way. So I think that that's our reality, and we try things and we step. Now, you know, obviously there's electronic arts, there's all these, these things, but I don't have a client that's ready. We can suggest, we can invade, we can explore, we're willing to talk. I mean, uh, that's certainly part of our d DNA is to be in inquisitive and curious, but. I mean, your Maxi Museum is extraordinary. You know, the way in which you move through that museum and uh, uncover the exhibitions. And I'm just thinking about the connection between the digital world and your work and also the fact that how do we get people to enjoy a, an online exhibition or an experience where we're not able to be in the physical space? Um, well, I mean, in a way, in that sense, I'm quite old fashioned. I really believe uh, in architecture. I think, um, I think um, maybe that eventually in the future, uh, the art uh, will, will only be possible to view certain pieces uh, digitally. Uh, but what is more interesting for me is that how that experience uh, could feed back into making uh, even a more um, fluid or complex uh, a rich reality. Um, because I, I mean, from my personal experience, no matter how much I've seen uh, buildings uh, on, in a photograph or a movie or whatever, it has never been the same as going to the site, you know, I mean, to, to, to experience it physically. But I think all these things can add, add to, and I think from my own personal experience, these, uh, these drawings which we did earlier, which everybody thought they were a completely waste of time, they are very difficult to read, you can't understand why would anybody do them. They really did feedback to the work. And 
even from my personal experience, when I go to certain projects, I see these things come out. So I think that for me, it really it depends on how it feeds back, how, um, yeah, how, how does it, what, what, what kind of things we can do. I can't predict, but what kind of things we can achieve in the future. I mean, 40 years ago, nobody thought they, will, they can do the Bilbao. Uh, nobody thought they can do lots of other things. And I think that, um, and I always say this, I think the Bilbao effect was very important to people like myself because every city wanted a Bilbao. And, and that was, and people always uh, talk about, you know, iconic architecture in a rather negative way as if it's, a, you know, that you become an iconic architect because you just want to do that. Uh, but I think it has really empowered architecture. You know, and the architect is much more empowered, is more important uh, these days. People respect you. When I started in my schooling days, architects were a bad word because they had, in the 60s, they had ruined, especially in England, ruined the England, ruined the countryside, the city. So that, and they thought of you as a kind of a service person. And I think that has changed because of the interest of the media and because also of these experiments which one, some of us were lucky enough to build. Uh, so I think that it was very important they did not remain as an idea, that they actually were, became a real project. And I think in the same way, um, the digital thing. So if, if you talk to the uh, art, direct, art museum directors that are sort of running the art culture, Museum of Modern Art, uh, Sirota, uh, I don't know who else named them. They came out blazing against me in Bilbao. They, a lot of them probably hate her work, hate my work, hate our galleries. It's not, this is not uh, accepted, you know? Now you hear that Museum of Modern Art is having troubles, so uh, I'd like to hear more about that. Hell no. <laughs> There's no way. Uh, so there is retribution. I did, I, at, there, at one point, Lowry was saying so many things against me that I, tr I, I uh, challenged him to a duel in Central Park. Uh, but there is this, and it's, you know, it's normal, there is this pushback. And so if you look at the number of museums that are built in the world from the Bilbao era to now, and uh, you'll find that most of them have nothing to do with Zaha Hadid or Frank Gehry. Um, I, Go ahead. No, no. I actually wanted to address an issue that you raised yesterday with our students, which was sort of fascinating. You had mentioned to them that in spite of all the extraordinary abilities of digital visualization, when you finish a building, you frequently have these kind of serendipitous moments of discovery when you walk in and you see something that you never thought would be there. And you said they were almost always positive, which is a good thing. But I thought maybe I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And maybe you could talk about some of those discoveries that you saw in your work once it was built. Well, I think that, um, I mean, maybe not so much these days, but uh, in, the, in our early days, we used to do uh, drawings of uh, the same building about, I mean, 10, 20 times. Uh, also, every product had many options. Uh, once uh, we were invited to do this um, house in, uh, in Holland, and there were 10 architects. And, you know, I, I typically made 10 options, but I, for the graphic purposes, I drew them on the master plan. So Bernard Shumi called me and said to me, Zaha, you can't do all of them. I said, no, I wasn't intending to. It was just a kind of, a, uh, less so now. But I think now, you know, uh, that these kind of options are resolved through, through computer uh, manipulation. Um, I think it's first the scale uh, and adjacency, you know? Um, yeah, you, yeah, I mean, there are also very personal moments. You know, maybe others don't notice them or don't like them, whatever. Um, and suddenly, you know, you begin to connect um, 
things which were very influential on you, maybe in film. When I was in Baku recently, there were these images of these people walking on the surface of the building. And suddenly I thought, well, you know, it was exactly like um, Spellbound, if anybody know that movie by Hitchcock, uh, with, a, with a surrealist scene um, going down the slope. When I did, we designed this building, I didn't think about that side, but it was only when it was completed. Um, yeah, so there are these kind of moments which um, suddenly all the lights look like a, some sort of a, a spatial explosion. Um, so I think there are always these kind of moments, even in Rome, when you see, although you talk about it when you discuss the project, when you're designing it, that the layers of the building can see through, blah, blah, you know, but you don't really know for sure if it works. And so when it does work, you know, and uh, you haven't thought about that you can see not only through, but also down and above, that you are in a completely immersed space. Um, that's what, you know, when you, when you are in that moment, you, you know that these uh, geometric tricks, let's say, work, because people think, oh, you know, it means nothing, you know, you can say, your view expands and whatever, you know. But I think they do. And uh, in a way, they are quite uh, old-fashioned tricks, but uh, they work. So I think that these things, if they impact on the work, on the, or on the urbanism, or on the, the way the city can operate, because I think that um, we are still operating within um, normative means. You know, we haven't changed our cities enormously. The streets are the same, the transport is the same. Uh, so it hasn't changed very much. That's a good segue, actually. I would love for, to have you guys talk a little bit about education, about how do we make this change, right? How do we create a different future than the one that we have? Young arts. Young arts. I mean, I'm thinking about our students right here. Exactly. So I, you talked a lot yesterday about teaching, and even within your studio, you, everyone can come to the table with an idea, is what you said yesterday. And Paula, I mean, big part yeah, of your job I have job to say, they come to my table uh, with, with a bit of uh, wariness, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in case it's not. But I think it is very important that people, uh, within a, even an office, they think they have a worthy idea to you know, it's not, uh, I don't think it works anymore. Maybe in you know, 30 years ago, I would do a sketch and insist they can look at the sketch, but not anymore. I think that, um, I mean, I personally, I enjoy teaching. Uh, unfortunately, now, it, it, I, I also, my teaching method from the AA days, AA days was, you know, full on. I was there almost every day. And that was the period I enjoyed the most in teaching. I can't do that now. It's impossible. Uh, I mean, last year I really enjoyed the Yale Studio. Um, it was uh, it was great, and it also it was also important. It because there was so much resistance, not by the students, uh, by the atmosphere, um, and uh, not from Bob, but there was that not to be not from Bob, but there is uh, what we've always written at the A was the, what I call, not because they're practical, the pragmatist, or and they come in different uh, guises. They started as um, promo, they go into rationalism, and they, they come as a historicist, they appear as now as some other. Uh, Neo-minimalism. Well, it, it's not even, uh, it's minimalism, but it's kind of with austerity, and they, they pretend to be uh, politically correct because, uh, you know, iconic work between brackets is extravagant. So in the name of being modest, they create monster monstrosities. But actually these um, minimalist uh, interventions are much more, uh, let's say, because monumental, you know? And, 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 and so there is uh, that. So it was interesting to teach there because I, had forgotten that these that that kind of that kind of scene reemerges all the time, and they want to uh, sort of we'll go back to the 70s because that was a great moment, and I agree it was a great moment. But we've passed that moment. Uh, we learned from that moment. 
we have reinvented things in the last 30 years, which have been phenomenal. And we cannot say, oh, let's go back to that area because that was just uh, a time of glory for certain, for certain people. So I think that, um, I mean, the AI was involved with for many years. Um, it's very good. I think, I think the English schools, for example, if I want to say, um, they have a, they need to, I think, now decide which every school would, which direction it should take. Because I think it's this idea that also from the 70s that everything, you know, let's try everything again, mm -hmm. um, is not gonna uh, kind of push the repertoire. Mm -hmm. It's very important to really focus and push uh, these fields and to be able to connect to all these mediums mm -hmm. uh, to make an excellent thesis. Right. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. And Frank, you know, I don't know where you find the time, but um, I hear you're doing some interesting things at UCLA with your friends Greg Lynn and Tom Main. Could you maybe talk a little bit about Supra Studio? And also perhaps maybe talk about the graduate students you work with and then maybe also the elementary kids who might get a chance to work with you. So um, the Super Studio, I'm embarrassed to say I've only been to once. And so I don't but it's, it's so bloody exciting, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> um, I love what Greg and Tom are doing and um, they're exploring. I started the studio with the idea of exploring the separation of systems from uh, shelter and opening that idea of having a power pack and a shelter and uh, I thought uh, I didn't expect they would go into the shelter only part, which is logical because they don't know how to do the technology part. Uh, and it's grown into some wonderful uh, expressions and language. Once you're free of all the, the junk you have to put in a building, I think there's a lot of freedom. So that's, that's been very interesting. Uh, what did you ask about the graduate the student? What about the elementary kids? Okay, so, uh, Long time ago, I started, uh, I was asked to go to an elementary school and uh, talk to an elementary school class. And I went to third graders and had a, spent a day. And then a week later, I went to fourth graders. And then a week later, I went to fifth graders. And a week later, I went to sixth graders. And the, the word creativity disappeared slowly from all of that by the sixth grade. And it was, it was frightening. How, how the reading, writing, and arithmetic, which is, I'm not depreciating it, but it sort of took over and a lot of kids get marginalized in that uh, game that can't do that. And I have family members that have struggled with those kind of things. Uh, the, so I, I started going seriously and I did some programs with my sister who's an educator where we gave them a, a studio to design a, and that's how I got into Young Arts. I, Lynn asked me to do it and they came to my studio and we did this program. But when you go to the so-called ghetto schools where they're educated, you know, it's really difficult. Uh, when I had them making a, a, a neighborhood or a city with boxes and blocks and to make the library and the hotel and that kind of stuff, I had them painting little boxes and tubes and stuff. And I realized that it opened, opened them. And I was able to teach math within the, the af same afternoon. I was able to go to, uh, to very basic math and stuff, which, which made me realize. Anyway, cut to the present. I'm still interested in that topic and I'm now uh, have the up the resource to do it. Uh, I've hired a a person who's a lobbyist who's with the California Arts Council, and we're starting a program of turnaround schools. I don't I, forgive me. I don't know all the topics and everything, but that that we're going to bring uh, an art teacher into ten elementary schools, and and put them there, pay them 
to uh, start talking with with the hope that this will have an impact. I've talked. Jerry Brown is involved. Uh, uh, Yo-Yo Ma has been doing this. Some artists have been doing it uh, already, but this is trying to get it together, and we're raising funds and stuff. Well, I mean, it's, that sounds like a, the, also, the possibility, I think, of... You know, it's again, the law requires arts education right. in the elementary school, and it's not being provided. So we've talked to Tony Romero, this ACLU president, and asked him if he would entertain a lawsuit against the government. <laughs> I mean, I think the opportunity to even be introduced to design at a young age, well, how that might change our future, I think is incredible. I wonder if maybe we can take this opportunity, if there's some questions from the audience, to make sure that we have time to do that. We have two microphones at the ends of the ramps over here, and maybe we could just turn the lights on above those microphones so that we can see if there are people there. It's very hard for us to see out there, so... microphone at the end of the ramp. Could we add some light down there, if that's possible? Go ahead, ask your question. Uh, yes, my name is Arlene Frankel, and my question is directed to Frank Erie, and I'm right here. Uh, Frank, I am a docent at the New World Center that houses the New World uh, Symphony. And uh, I escort people around our building talking about you and your designs all the time. So if your ears ring, you know that I'm talking about you. you. But I have a, a question that I want to ask you about the New World Center. What was your experience when you were uh, designing it and going through that and seeing it now? What is your experience about the New World Center? How do you feel about it? And uh, just give me some thoughts, because I'd like to talk to people when they come to, to uh, just really uh, uh, kind well, of uh, paraphrase what it's you're... It's probably something we should do separately, because I don't know if everybody wants to hear this story. Mike, Michael Tilson Thomas, I met when he was eight years old. I babysat him. <laughs> um, and I... Uh, by 11 years old, he was in, uh, at USC in the graduate music program. So an extraordinary human being, extraordinary talent. Um, over the years, we talked. I think he thought my architecture was wacko. Um, uh, and he was doing his thing. And I was, anyway, we got to Miami. He asked me to get involved. Uh, the program, I watched him teach uh, conducting over internet two to a young orchestra in a faraway land. And uh, he had his orchestra and he, the, other, the young orchestra played a, a, some part of um, whatever, Tchaikovsky, Mahler, but and uh, then he would stop them, and then he would show them how to, how he would do it. And but in not that they had to do it his way, the issues that he was talking about. Man, I I started crying. It was so exciting to do that. So, uh, the idea of building an experimental place for young uh, musicians, because this is a stepping stone facility for these these young musicians to move in t into uh, prime time. And uh, so I, that's what I was doing. I got into it. Um, neither Michael and, nor I knew how to use any of the technology we were, we were putting in the place. And uh, uh, both decided that the kids would figure it out, and they did. <laughs> and so, it, the director is sitting over there, and he told me that it still works, so I'm happy about that. Do we have a question over here? I don't know if anyone, okay. 
Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. I just wanted to speak about a few things that I see here in, in the city of Miami. I'm really happy to be in front of this panel. Uh, I noticed that in the city of Miami, there are a lot of wonderful things that are moving towards the future, but Miami is still very stuck in the past when it comes to eco-awareness. I went to school in California for a few years, specifically to really catch up with the rest of the global community with green technology and eco-consciousness. And I found that things that were very norm in California uh, when I moved back to Miami, we're still very much stuck in the past. There's not a, a recycling uh, system here in Miami uh, that uh, is up to par with the future of the global community. And as we speak about the future of the city of Miami and design and the concerns of the future, uh, what do any of the folks at the panel uh, see? Uh, also, when Frank, when you mentioned uh, the importance of of, of the lawsuit, uh, the government lawsuit, that really opened up my my eyes. Uh, I mean, that's obviously what would, would take in the city of Miami uh, legal action in order for just to have like uh, compost bins. Uh, we don't even have that here in the city of Miami. And as far as design, I'm sure the Young Arts Association would be uh, really pushing the future uh, for this city and the community by involving uh, an eco and awareness and bringing it to the level that the rest of the world is in. Could you speak on that? Any of you, please. <laughs> Perhaps Paul? Uh, I, I can only tell you that you're talking about compost stands. I come from New York. And uh, um, I hear you and I completely, I come from New York, but I also come from Europe. And I remember how completely flabbergasted I was when I saw people throwing aluminum cans in the same, uh, can, in the same bins as everything else. So in a way, New York, even though last night when I was hearing Rosie Perez speak, I was all feeling mushy and soft inside because of that accent. New York is a very dysfunctional when it comes to, um, when it comes to recycling. So in a way, I think that policy um, comes from the grassroots and I think that California is that way because people were very vocal and really pushed the government to create policy because you can be educated but until there are laws and regulations nothing happens and so maybe the same thing should happen also here in Miami and I'll try to do my best in New York. I think we actually have time for one more question. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, being on this panel and for doing this presentation. My name is Sam Van Leer. I'm with Urban Paradise Guild. We're a Miami nonprofit doing urban forestry and urban agriculture. Um, Miami's future is going to be defined by climate change more than anything else in the coming century. And uh, change is going to be the norm. It is going to be forced upon us. And I'm concerned that so many are still in denial about this and that instead of dealing with these changes gracefully, we're going to be dealing with them piecemeal, uh, very ungracefully, and that it's going to be a train wreck. Uh, how would you all approach changing perceptions, changing consciousness when it comes to how the public looks at design of our city, the redesign of our city for future sea levels, et cetera? You're not going to win this one, my friend. I, I wish, I think, I hope, I hope you do. Uh, the denial mechanism, as I said earlier, is, is a really serious uh, uh, affliction. And it's hard to make people understand. Uh, I mean, th that there's 15% of waste in the construction industry. Everybody knows that. Or 30%, or I'm sorry. The American Institute of Architects even says it might be 40%. Um, and we go down bogus ways. I mean, I'm not against the LEADS program, but uh, one of our consultants in Germany studied 300 LEADS approved uh, projects, and they use more, en more energy than normal projects. So there's a lot of false starts. There's a lot of stuff going on that that you know you buy into. Um, what I do is I go home, I sip a little wine, and I read Don Quixote. <laughs> okay. 
Well, unfortunately, we get to the end of our time here for today. Uh, it's wonderful for you all to join us here in Miami. And also, even more wonderful for you to be interested in design. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you guys so much. Um, oh man, um, <laughs> I hope this pressure, uh, this question, um, is good enough for the whole audience. Um, but I was just curious um, as to whether you think that design and architecture um, can take on the role of of um, changing lifestyles and behavior. Like we, we talked a little bit about the um, the denial mechanism, and I'm wondering if architecture and design um, has that power to, to to shift people to really change the way that they live. Um, yeah, I mean, I do. Um, I um, I don't have particularly any kind of proof, but I think um, architecture is is about well-being. And I think if people who live in a better environment, uh, they go to better schools, they work in a nice space, uh, they have nice, interesting streets, uh, the way they are designed or they are uh, in, in the way they, these things are adjacent to each other, what they see, I really do think it changes people. It is a 20th century dream, but I think it's still very valid. And it's a constant reminder every time I personally, when we did the Maggie Center, but we go back, the Maggie Center is a, is a very small project which was uh, for uh, cancer, cancer care. And uh, it's done like a kind of, almost like a private house. But it goes back to this idea of the, the 20th, 20th century pioneers about how the environment can, that your own environment can, can help you, how we, to bring in light to these kind of spaces. Or we designed a school, it's the same. These issues come back again. Uh, you know, the school was um, the, the kids, although they were sometimes dropped, delivered to the class by their gang, they wanted to be in that school because they liked it. And the parents were begging the, the headmasters to keep the school the kids there longer. These were like a school which is done for kids who have never had a proper meal throughout for t t ten years of their lives because. They came from broken homes. Their families had not worked for four generations. They all lived on the dole. So I think doing housing uh, in, in, to give them a level of luxury uh, in spatially, I think is very important. I think it's very important to build housing in the inner cities because otherwise they are all shun. I mean, I went, I, I was driving through Miami and looking at, you know, of course, the skyline is interesting. One can do great buildings here, you know, on the, on the, on the bay, on the beach, uh, blah, blah. But there are areas which are uh, really uh, beyond, uh, below the poverty line. And these where you can do, you know, some, not experimentation for the sake of it, but try out, uh, you know, public housing and see what you can do. Uh, unfortunately, even in England, the public housing program dropped. No, they don't call it social housing, they call it affordable housing. And, and it's not done as a kind of major agenda. It's always done when they build other housing. But I, I do believe the environment and the, what you invest uh, in, the, in the city uh, uh, is very, I think, what will change the way the people behave. Again, thank you so much for coming. And I just want to conclude by once again congratulating and thanking these amazing, young, talented people that have been here all week.